Coming up this week, Opel's SUV family grows yet again with the advent of the Grandland X. It's got the signature wing-like elements in the headlamps and that Opel crease on the bonnet to give it the family face. Hot hatches from Renault and Volkswagen make headlines. 147 kilowatts and 320 newtons are transmitted to the front wheels via either a six-speed manual transmission or VW's trusty DSG. And we visit Mahindra's new assembly facility in Durban. It's our way of committing to the country. We've been here for a while, we've done well. Hello and welcome to Ignition GT. So we're in the second week of our new half hour format. We really hope that you do like the way we've changed things up. Remember, you can, of course, get in touch with us on any one of our social media platforms and let us know what you think. We really would like to hear from you in terms of what you like and what you don't like. And very importantly, where you think we can improve. Right, let's get back to the show. And first on the lineup, Lindsay samples the latest product from Opel Stable. When Opel announced in late 2016 that they'd be badging all their SUVs and crossovers with an X from there on out, it was a clear indication that the company was no longer just about building fantastic hatches. Understandably, they wanted a bigger share of the growing appetite for crossovers and SUVs. And two years later, they're hoping this is lucky number three. It's called the Grandland X, and it completes the trio with Marker X and Crossland X that Opel is hoping will make up around 50% of their volume. This, though, is the first time the German brand has played in the so-called SUV C segment, or cars between 400 and 600,000 Rand. And it's up against some stiff competition. Around 2,500 vehicles are sold in this segment a month in South Africa, so hopes are high for Grandland X to take a big bite out of that. On the outside, it's already grabbed my attention. This is one of the prettiest SUVs in the segment, in my opinion, yet it still manages to be handsome at the same time. It's got the signature wing-like elements in the headlamps and that opal crease on the bonnet to give it the family face. Around the back, the lights are very Astra, which is no bad thing, and for me, works in bucket loads. The only car possibly better looking in the segment is the Peugeot 3008, with which it incidentally shares a platform, thanks to the buyout of Opel by PSA in 2017. But this is not just a pug in a lightning bolt. While it does share the 3008's 1.6 litre turbo engine, this car is wider, longer and weighs quite a lot less. In fact, Opel tells us it comes in 100 kilos less than its closest German competitor. That was one of the key targets for Grandland X, weight saving to improve efficiencies. I'm not sure how much difference it's really made with the car claiming a 7 litre per 100 kilometre fuel consumption, although our real world stat was closer to 10, but it feels light enough on its feet. Riding on 17 inches as standard, the Grandland has all the solidity I loved in the Mokka, but felt was missing from the Crossland. It feels all German in the way it's engineered. The ride is still a little firm for my liking, but other than that, it's a real pleasure to drive as far as SUVs go. That could also be partly down to the ground clearance of this car, which sits just over 120 millimeters. Compare that with a Peugeot or a lot of other SUVs that sit closer to 200 millimeters, and that explains why it feels more car-like to drive. And I guess why not? I mean, SUVs hardly ever go off-road these days, and you've still got the elevated seating position. The Grandland's 121 kilowatts and 240 newton meters are more than sufficient and mated to a six-speed auto. It's perfect for both around town and open road. All three models on offer in South Africa have the same drivetrain, with only the spec level influencing the price difference. This is the mid-spec Enjoy model that we're driving, and at 465,000 Rand, it's really well specced. I've got a leather steering wheel with cruise control, which is standard across the range. There's park assist, hill start assist, six airbags, Apple CarPlay, lane departure warning, uh, traffic sign recognition, and this eight-inch infotainment touchscreen. Very impressive. That comes standard with navigation in the top spec model, which is priced at 560,000 Rand. Our test car also has the optional extra of heated seats and this great panoramic sunroof. It may not sound like anything out of the ordinary, but compared spec for spec with competitors like Tiguan and Cougar, it starts looking like great value. 
Its Peugeot sibling, however, does offer a little more, and at a cheaper price, in a far more appealing wrapper. There's nothing that competes with a 3008 when it comes to interiors, even at double the price. But the Opel does a decent enough job. Everything's easy to use. There's ergonomic thought behind it. You can use this little lip here to rest your hand while you use the touch screen. Seats are comfy and there's nothing too distracting. At the back, it's roomy and comfortable, and the flex fold seats are easy to flip forward in a 60 40 split to expand on the very respectable 514 litres of boot space. There's also a double floor if you want to hide some of your stuff from view, and the top spec Cosmo model has hands free boot opening with a wave of your foot. Opel cites the Grandland X recipe as comprising elevated seating, efficient powertrains, low weight, space for five top tech and a sporty SUV design. Well, they've certainly hit the mark on all of those counts and there's really only one reason I can think of why a potential buyer wouldn't add this to their shopping list and that is future of the Opel brand in South Africa. Well, obviously at the press conference for Grandland X, Opel was very keen to share some of the successes in the first 120 days since they took over distributorship in South Africa officially in January. The sales trend is positive. 35 dealers have been appointed and Opel Finance has been launched. They've also been busy with upgrades to the Opel corporate identity at those dealerships and they're bullish about their future here. With a 5-year 90,000 km service plan and 5-year 120,000 km warranty, Opel SA is showing good faith in its product. The Opel Grandland X is a really attractive car to me, not just to look at, but also to sit in and to drive. And taken spec for spec against its wide array of competitors, I would certainly put it in the top three cars I would recommend in this price category. Lucky number three for Opel, indeed. Stay tuned because after the break we take a look at the week's automotive newsmakers. Based on the chassis and running gear of a 488 GTB, the bespoke bodywork was heavily inspired by the F40. And later on in the show we get an inside look at Mahindra's new local assembly plant. Now we need to get to the next step which is start investing locally, uh, use local assembly, uh, use uh, local components. You're watching Ignition GT. Hello and welcome back. So it has been a busy week for the local motoring industry. A number of really exciting models have debuted locally and abroad. But before we get to that, it's time for a celebration. Chinese SUV manufacturer Haval last month celebrated its first birthday in South Africa. The company recorded impressive sales figures during this period and the dealers in attendance had good reason to be smiling. It was also announced that the local head office would relocate to a new premises in Lindbrough Park in Santon, which also houses the parts distribution centre. What really got the tongues wagging was the soon-to-be-launched H9. Size-wise, it competes with the Ford Everest and Toyota Fortuner, and like those formidable rivals, it also boasts seven seats. Haval gave us a taste of the newcomer's off-road prowess, and if they can get the pricing right, they could be on to another winner. A little later on in the show, we chat to Haval South Africa MD Charles Zhao to find out more about the fledgling company's local success. Further afield, Volkswagen T6 production at the historic Hanover plant has reached the 500,000 mark. The very first transporter rolled off the production line in 1956, and since then just under 9 million units have been built there. Back on the home front, VW South Africa last week introduced the newest addition to its long line of iconic GTI models. Powered by a turbocharged 2-litre TSI engine, the newcomer has no shortage of horses. 147 kilowatts and 320 newtons are transmitted to the front wheels by either a 6-speed manual transmission or VW's trusty DSG. Not surprisingly, the new pocket rocket was launched at the racetrack, with consensus among local journalists being that it is every inch a GTI. The Ignition GT team will be putting the Polo through its paces in the near future, so keep tuning in for more details. 
Previously, we reported on the local debut of the limited edition Renault Clio RS18, and subsequently we've had the chance to sample it for ourselves, around Swartkop's raceway no less. The changes may be mostly cosmetic, but there's nothing wrong with this Clio's technical credentials. 162 kilowatts and 280 Nm mean 0-200 is yours in just 6.6 .6 seconds. The RS18 also comes standard with the lowered and stiffened trophy chassis and an Akrapovich exhaust system. Often regarded as possessing one of the best chassis in the segment, the F1-inspired version of the Clio is nimble and agile through the corners, thanks to the high levels of grip from its performance tyres and the E-diff. If there is any chink in the RS's armour, it's the EDC twin-clutch auto box. While the changes are quick enough, you often find yourself in the wrong gear when entering or exiting a corner, and the column-mounted shift paddles are hard to reach, especially when applying full lock during hard cornering. Ferrari recently unveiled the youngest offspring from its one-off program, the SP38, at the company's Fiorano test track. Based on the chassis and running gear of a 488 GTB, the bespoke bodywork was heavily inspired by the F40. The car was specifically designed for use on road and track, so after the official unveiling, the keys were handed to the proud new owner for a few hard laps. How lucky can one guy be? Well, almost as lucky as this Mercedes-Benz owner. 30 years ago, Christopher White was piloting his beloved W123 along Chapman's Peak Drive, the prologue to what would become one of the most famous accidents in South African motoring history. So I was, I was in a very cool place playing music. You know what the tape was? Tracy Chapman, fast car. And then I took my eye off the road for literally seconds. Then I just saw these cassettes going through the roof because the sunroof was open. <laughs> these things flying past me and then kadoom. Christopher and his Benz plunged more than 30 stories and landed on the jagged rocks along the shoreline. Miraculously, he escaped with just a few bruises and the marketing folk went on to create a local advertising legend. Mercedes-Benz has revisited this historic incident to showcase how it might be avoided in the future thanks to autonomous driving technology. We'll be taking an in-depth look at self-driving cars in an upcoming episode of Ignition GT. But for now, we'll leave you with Mr. White's reaction. This is real, it's a bit scary. Yes, every week we bring you the latest automotive news from around the globe, so be sure to keep tuning into Ignition GT to keep abreast of events. After the break, we're off to Durban for a look inside Mahindra's new assembly plant. Don't go away. In recent years, South Africa's economic climate hasn't always favoured the automotive giants of the world. General Motors, Citroen and a few smaller Chinese firms have all departed our shores, citing financial and economic difficulties. It's not all doom and gloom, however, as South Africa is often regarded as prime location for automotive assembly and manufacturing. We're very small in, in global terms, so we must always remember that we mustn't get excited, uh, overexcited about, about what we're doing. I think people will have a clearer idea of whether to invest or not by the end of this year because the current automotive production and development program expires at the end of 2020. Big discussions going on about what should happen after that because the new program will go from 21 till 2035. So everyone is holding off on, on new, major new investments at the moment until they get a sense of what's going on there. BMW recently invested over 6 billion rand to upgrade the Rosslyn plant to produce the new X3, while VW also tooled up to manufacture their new generation Polo and Polo Vivo in Newton Ake. Well, thankfully we can now add another investment to the list, as Mahindra recently unveiled their new assembly plant in Durban. What we now want to do in South Africa is uh, establish local manufacturing because we believe 
a um, couple of things. Number one, it gives us the ability to tailor our products to exactly what the South African consumer wants. Priority number two, it's our way of committing to the country. We've been here for a while, we've done well, now we need to get to the next step, which is start investing locally, uh, use local assembly, uh, use uh, local components. We also intend to address the fluctuating demand on a much agile way, which otherwise, if as an importer, you cannot. So this will give us better reach to the market, better speed to the market, and better value to the market in terms of offering these things. This is the starting point. And in addition to customization, it gives me the opportunity to export out of South Africa into Mozambique, into Lesotho, into Swaziland, Botswana, um, and instead of shipping out of India. And so it is my long-term plan to make South Africa as my hub for much of the African continent, at least sub-Saharan Africa. It is, it is a tiny investment. It's a, it's a 10 million rand investment. But it's, it's the statement which is more important than, than the amount of money. Because here's one of the big Asian manufacturers finally putting some money into South Africa. Eventually, a few local components will come in. They've already identified some of those. They're talking about 40% local content eventually. Mahindra tends to take a long-term view. So they're not looking for big things now, but they do want big things in, say, five years, 10 years, 20 years. The big thing for them is the rest of Africa. So this is a statement of intent rather than, than a, a huge investment in its own right. At present, the production output of the plant is limited to 2,500 vehicles per annum, with a target of 4,000 once the operations are at full capacity. Mahindra has also promised that 80% of their staff will be locals who have never had the opportunity of formal employment. Mahindra's confidence in South Africa has been further bolstered by a steady increase in their market share. This plant is certainly a step in the right direction in realizing their goals of becoming a big player in the local and global automotive scene. Mahindra in South Africa has started its journey in 2004. We ended up last financial year with the ever highest number of retails that we did. We have got 60 dealers across South Africa and we have over 40,000 happy and satisfied customers here in South Africa. Not to mention that Mahindra has achieved a compound annual growth rate of over 4.6% a year, placing them in the league of the five fastest growing automotive companies in South Africa during the same period. Besides the rugged pickup which is already being built at the plant, Mahindra's expansion plan for South Africa isn't limited to just cars. We are by volume the largest tractor manufacturer in the world. Most tractors under 110 horsepower are actually assembled in India and uh, South Africa has a very vibrant agricultural industry. It's only logical uh, for us to bring our tractor brand uh, into South Africa, so that's something that we're looking at. Uh, we do also make um, construction equipment, we make um, diesel generators, we make uh, medium and heavy trucks. So our portfolio is large. Our presence in South Africa is at the moment limited to automotive. We need to expand that presence. Now, in a staunchly traditional market like South Africa, it is very hard for a new manufacturer to make inroads. In fact, a number of them couldn't crack it and have closed up shop. Some, like Mahindra, have done a great job of staking their claim in the marketplace. Likewise, the new kid on the block, Havel, has proven that it can be done too. With us in studio now is Charles Zhao from Havel to give us some insight into their successes. One year birthday for Havel, but GWM has been in South Africa for 11 years. Very, very difficult to get into a South African market that is quite Eurocentric. We like the European type of vehicles when it comes to passenger vehicles and SUVs. What you do from a Bucky perspective, your success is there. Are you as surprised at how well Havel has done in South Africa in a short time like a year? Actually, you know, this is something we expected. Um, frankly speaking, you see, it's only one year time since Havel launched in South Africa. 
but uh, our current uh, retail sales is um, average, average monthly is around 550 uh, 50 units. Mm. Um, but uh, I believe with the, with the quality of our product, the, the support from the, from the factory, and also our excellent dealer network, I believe that is something we deserve it. Yeah. Look, I mean, that for me is what I always find amazing with South Africans because you look at people like Toyota, luxury brand Lexus, Nissan with Infinity, and South Africans struggle to see the, the upmarket luxury part. But it's almost like people don't associate Hover with GWM, mm. which potentially is a problem because then you're convincing people this is an all new brand, but you've managed to cross that line perfectly. Uh, actually, it take us some time, yeah. uh, because um, GWM before it was uh, done all imported by a distributor, but now all the Havel and GWM products are, are done all by ourselves. Yeah. We are the uh, wholly owned subsidiary company of GWM China, uh, so currently we have all the support from from China and uh, and also to to run a brand. We know how important it is to support our dealers mm -hmm. and support our customers. So you see, after we, we launched Havel, uh, launch Havel brand in, in South Africa, we really have done a lot. Uh, but most of the thing, you know, from the, from the dealer, especially from the dealer side, we listen to the dealers, and we also trying to, to uh, make our, our service, our product to a higher standard. And uh, I believe in, in this way, it helped us to grow ourselves uh, faster. Yeah, but Charles, Challenges still for the brand in this market. What is what is the hardest thing for you to sell your product here? Um, first thing, I think is uh, the exchange rate is something that uh, giving us uh, pressure. It's really and 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 the moment you see the the rent rate has become weak again, mm. uh, and this uh, this is uh, definitely increasing our importing costs, yeah. and which might, might uh, result in uh, price increase. And the other thing, uh, I'm not saying challenge, but a concern. You see, for, for, for the emerging brands uh, like Havel in South Africa, many people may still take us as, a, as another Chinese brand. Mm. And I believe currently people should have different uh, man, uh, how to say, mentality, opinion towards Chinese brand. Chinese brand is not just uh, only, we, we, we are not just to have the advantage in price. But also, you see, the building quality, all, all the safety features, yeah. all the engine power, all the finishing of the product. Once the people come into the uh, sitting, sit, sit inside of the car and test drive the vehicle, they will see the difference. Chinese brand is not like 10 years ago. Yeah. So maybe still some people have this kind of mentality. Charles, for you guys that to have a lot of exciting product, H9 I know yes. recently launched, so there is and that's what it comes down to. Good product on a showroom that is accessible to the consumer. Thanks for, for joining us on the show. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank you very much. And with that, we've come to the end of another show. Do join us again next week for more from the world of motoring, including our driving impressions of the all-new Suzuki Swift. Toyota introduces a Dakar edition of the Evergreen Hilux, while Nissan's eagerly awaited Micra also takes a bow. But until next time, guys, please buckle up and drive safely out there. Thank <laughs> you.